Hello and welcome to the West Guilford Baptist Church family and friends. This is our first online service for the year 2021. I'm Neil Moore, Pastor Brian has asked me to give some introductory remarks before the worship service begins. So with a sad and grieving heart, I announce the passing of Pastor Brian and Diane's daughter, Laura, affectionately known as Buddy. I'm sure we all extend our condolences to the families. An announcement regarding the funeral service, a private visitation and celebration of life will take place at West Guilford Baptist Church on Monday morning, January the 4th, 2021, at 11 o'clock. Unfortunately, they will not be able to live stream Buddy's service. Buddy's service will be videotaped to be shared on the West Guilford Baptist Church YouTube channel. As an expression of sympathy, donations to Community Living Halliburton County or to West Guilford Baptist Church would be appreciated by the family. Further, keep in mind that there are no Sunday services at the church until further notice due to the COVID restrictions. With regards to the sermon, we wish to thank uh, Pastor Paul Graham for providing sermon messages. He is the pastor at Lakeside Church in Halliburton. Let us read some scripture, and these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, found in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And I like what it has to say in Romans chapter 5 and 8, that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We must come as those acknowledging that we are sinners if we are going to have God's salvation. And Hebrews has something else to say. And it says... In Hebrews 11 and 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let us look to God in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we Acknowledge that you are the maker of heaven and earth, the sustainer of life, the giver of all good things. We thank you that we can commit into your hands, Pastor Brian and his family, as they grieve the loss of their daughter, Buddy, and we know, Lord, that 
There are heavy hearts because of this, but as your word tells us, those who know Christ do not sorrow as those that have no hope because there is hope beyond death for those who are in Christ, the blessings of your glorious heaven. And we thank you. We pray, Lord, that the uh, messages in the songs that will be sung and the word that will be preached through your servant Paul Graham will speak to our hearts and draw us close to you. We just commit to you, Lord, each one who partakes. We ask that you will bless each family uh, listening into this service and that you will meet their heart's need. I'm sure we all would desire that COVID-19 would come to an end soon, but we do acknowledge that you are in control and that your purposes are being carried out. So keep us from fuming and frustrated and worrying about it, but trusting you rather. Bless our time today, Lord, and minister to each heart. Give us ears to hear. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. And now we're going to have a brief message from Pastor Brian to give us a welcome and an update. Thank you. Good morning, West Guilford Baptist Church family and friends. I wanted to send to you a little portion of a video uh, thanking you for your prayers and uh, love and support for Diane and I, Buddy, and the rest of our family for the last few weeks. Uh, as most of you have heard, uh, Buddy was promoted to glory uh, on Wednesday, uh, late uh, on the 30th at 1130 uh, at night. I was I had the very wonderful privilege of being with her, holding her hand as she took her last breath and uh, entered into glory to be with the Lord. Uh, I would be lying to say it has not been a challenging uh, time, for it has been. Uh, it's been a grieving time, uh, but in the midst of it, we've sensed uh, the Lord's love and peace and even his joy in our presence. So we um, are very appreciative for the community we live in, for you, our church family. Uh, we are planning a uh, service for Buddy. It's going to be a, one of those strange COVID-19 celebration of life service uh, events in that it's going to take place this Monday at 11 in the morning at West Guilford Baptist Church. There's only going to be 10 family members there. Um, we're going to be doing all the COVID protocol things that need to be done. Uh, we are going to have it taped like we do for our church services. And um, Betty Moore, our wonderful sister in the Lord, is going to coordinate putting it all together so we can send it out as soon as possible, Monday night or maybe uh, the next day so that you can watch it on YouTube or on Facebook, whatever you would like. Um, we want it to be a celebration of life because Buddy lived a full, rich life for the 34 years she was here on this earth. We want it to be something that will bring glory and honor to the Lord as we thank him for the gift she was to us. And uh, we want it to be something that will be an encouragement for those who watch and uh, we'll point you towards the hope we have in Christ. So, uh, God bless you. Thank you very much for uh, all you've done. Uh, I'm probably gonna be taking a few weeks off uh, after this funeral uh, before I'm back at the church, but uh, we will coordinate that, of course, with our deacons. So, God bless, and um, I'm thinking of you even as you're thinking of us. Okay, love you all. Bye. <laughs>
good to meet together in this way and to gather either online as you are through our website or through Facebook uh, or here at the church in person and we are glad to be able to be assembled together. 
And this month we are doing a little mini series on hope specifically. Of course, every message that we preach from the scripture is a message of hope. The Bible is relentlessly hopeful. But we want to particularly focus on the message of hope for this month as people in our community have received in their mail and uh, have perhaps seen online or through the newspapers the invitation to come and hear about the hope that we can have even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of everything else that is going on in our lives. And there's four big areas of hope, even though we could, as I said, talk about hope every single week and do talk about hope every single week. But there are four areas in which people regularly seem to need to find hope uh, in their lives these days and how God brings real hope to those areas. Uh, the first area is in our identity and who we are. The second area is in suffering and why we suffer. Thirdly, the area of addiction, or I will say idolatry, and we could put materialism, consumerism, all kinds of things that we become addicted to or capture our attention and enslave us. And then fourthly, hope in relationship. So that's the four part series that we'll do through November. Hope in our identity, hope in the midst of suffering, hope in the midst of addiction or idolatry, hope in our relationships with others. I don't know if you're like me, but um, at some point in your life, you probably got hooked for at least a few episodes, maybe a few seasons on the Antique Roadshow. And really what the Antique Roadshow boils down to is the anticipation of something that was lost or something that was overlooked in an attic, something that had sort of been encrusted, maybe somebody painted it or you know, an antique doll got sort of Walmart clothing put on it and it became hidden. And so the Antique Roadshow is a great example of a lost true identity, something that has been dimmed by misuse or abuse or neglect or trying to be something that it isn't. Somebody, you know, uses a priceless vase as a doorstop, whatever. It's true identity is unknown or misplaced until it is recognized and recovered and brought to light by someone who knows its true worth and knows its value intimately. And when we think about our identity, there is a certain element in which we need to recover our true identity because our identity as human beings has been dimmed. It has been covered over by misuse and by abuse and by um, people using our identity in the wrong way or the world using our identity in the wrong way. And so like that expert on the Antique Roadshow who discovers the true identity of that item so we can look to scripture and we can understand who it is that gives us our real identity and our true identity. And when we look at what's happening in the world today on this idea of identity and really all through history, it's apparent that we have a serious identity problem as people. For centuries, humanity has sought to find its identity in various places, but all of those places have been rooted in creation, rooted in the horizontal relationship that we have with others, rather than finding their identity in the creator or the vertical. Identity was first and often rooted in the class that we are born into, and philosophers like Socrates talked a great deal about the condition or the class or the place that a certain person is born into and how they must live their life faithfully in that class. Or it's rooted in the virtue that we exhibit. Philosophers like Plato talked about the human virtues and that we are valued based on the virtue that we exhibit or in our accomplishments and our deeds. The Stoics that came after said that our identity was found in what we left behind, the heritage of our deeds. Or it could be in our wealth, or it could be in our profession, as any Mr. and Mrs. Smith or Mr. and Mrs. Miller could tell you. It could be in our race, in our gender, even in our religion or in our lack of religion. People have found their identity at the horizontal level in relation to others. 
But it's not just a philosophical problem out there when we talk about identity. It's not just an intellectual exercise to consider identity in our society and in our life. Identity is deeply personal in our own lives. As at various times in your life, you struggle with identity as a husband, as a provider, your identity as a mother, as a wife, your value, your worth, your purpose. Every one of us has been there wondering who we are. Are we just the role that we fill? Are we just what we are qualified in the virtue that we bring? And we all struggle with our place in culture and with our heritage, with our relationship to others. We see this from the beginning to the end of our lives. Children are forming an identity. Teens are experimenting with identity. Adults are questioning the identity they've chosen or questioning the identity they feel that culture and society has thrust upon them. Every interaction in our culture today now seems rooted first and foremost in a clash of identities and intersectionality and tribes of people gathering in conclaves. And when we use the word tribes and we think of tribalism, we may think of something prehistoric or even ancient historic or other cultural, but make no mistake that we need to understand and use this word tribes and tribalism, because that is what we see in terms of human identity. All these sources of our identity are based on the physical world, they're based on the created world, they're based on the horizontal and our relationship to how we are created, how we are born, where we are born into, what class we are, what abilities we have, and how we relate to people beside us in society. And all of those horizontal identities ultimately fall short of offering us true hope. As many of us have found, we eventually run into an identity crisis. We may find acceptance for a while, we may find purpose for a while, we may find self-fulfillment for a while. When we first rush into the embrace, especially of a new identity or discovering a new tribe, but those identities that are really built solely on the affirmation of people surrounding us ultimately provide us with a hollow echo that does not fulfill and we know does not satisfy our true identity because they're one-dimensional, they're non-holistic, and in many cases, they're just plain untrue pictures of who we really are. Like that antique, like that priceless treasure that is crusted over or painted over or misused or abused or stowed away in the attic, we, those pictures of our identity are not true. So ultimately, it appears if we are left only to the created world to find our identity, then we base our sense of identity in two opposed methods that work together. Just follow me on this. This is the way in the horizontal sphere we define who we are. Two ways that are different but work together. First of all, we define ourselves by separation on one hand, by distancing ourselves from those identities that we reject, we are not those people. And then on the other hand, by belonging to another group of people, to another tribe, by proving to others what we are so that we can join them. So we define our identity on the horizontal plane and fundamentally in error by saying this is what we are not and then proving ourselves to say this is who we are. So firstly, we have this identity being falsely found in separation, which is creating tribes and defending our uniqueness or our differences. I'm not like other people. I don't support X. I don't believe in Y. I'm not one of those people. I saw a picture of a sign outside of a coffee shop online. And the, it's one of those blackboard signs that, you know, they have outside of pubs or or uh, coffee shops, and the top of the sign said in big bold letters with exclamation marks, no hipsters. We don't want your furry faced vegan diet, tiny feet and sawdust bedding. Wait, wait, that's hamsters. We mean no hamsters. You see, <laughs> joking aside, obviously this approach to defining identity is socially problematic. It balkanizes, it divides people and society from each other. We don't want hipsters. We don't want those kinds of people in here. Oh, I mean, we meant hamsters. But that kind of separation identity is the root of segregation. 
Unfortunately, we don't want your kind was a tragically popular sign in some places just 50 or 60 years ago. And tragically, those signs still exist today in some places. If not a sign on a door, it's a sign on the face or on the heart of the people that are present. That kind of identity by separation creates and amplifies and strengthens our need to identify and belong to another tribe. And that's the second method that we use. First, we separate and then we try to qualify ourselves for another tribe. Secondly, it's identity based on being accepted into, the, into a tribe or into a group by your merit. Because make no mistake, human acceptance is not unconditional. You don't get accepted into the identity of tribe X, Y, or Z unless you qualify and merit your belonging. It's one thing to separate from everything else, but then what are we a part of? And that leads to our identity being found in merit. Are we man enough? Are we woman enough? Uh, are we tough enough? Are we intelligent enough? Are we gay enough? Are we liberal enough? Are we conservative enough? Are we black enough? Are we rich enough? Are we gangster enough? Are we hipster or hamster enough to really belong to our tribe? And make no mistake, you must qualify. I think it was in 2016 or 2017 at the Women's March in Washington, D.C., women's groups were actually banned from marching in the Women's March because they were not female enough. They did not believe enough in the female identity of the march organizers as women to participate in a woman's march. So make no mistake, you must qualify, you must merit belonging in a tribe. The more we want to identify with a tribe then, the more we have to hyper-exaggerate our qualifications to merit our badge of belonging. And we see this happening all around us on the news, on social media, in our friendships, in our own lives. We feel the pressure in our own hearts that we have to amplify our qualifications, whether it is as mothers or husbands, as providers, as wives, as whatever it is. Ask any teenage boy or girl if they face this identity pressure every single day to be pretty enough, to be jock enough, to be goth enough, to be metal enough, to be thin enough, to be emo enough, to be gamer enough in order to belong to your tribe. And it doesn't go away when we become adults. The pressure to merit our identity in our place in society and among those in whom we commune is intense. And the effects of this false identity in tribalism starts with school ground bullying and isolating. And then we see that it escalates to exclusion and virtue or merit badging in social media and in social groups and political groups. And this kind of false identity in tribalism finds its final outcomes, unfortunately, in political polarization and then with violent demonstrations on the street, and then finally with radicalized individuals performing acts of terrorism for whatever identity they are being indoctrinated into and feel they must virtue signal, they must merit badge themselves as being worthy of belonging. And I'm not saying every identity group goes these distances. I'm not saying that every person in search of an identity goes this far, but this is the pressure of tribalism that we must belong, and that in belonging, we must exaggerate our merit or our qualification for belonging and the pressure that that puts, not just on our children, not just on our teenagers, but on adults. To belong is intense because we have this need for identity and many people are struggling in hopelessness because they have put their hope in a false identity or they've been unable to find their true identity, an identity that truly satisfies. And so we see these destructive steps of tribalism day by day, right from grade four or five at the school playground. We see it in our offices at work, and we see it all the way through to the headline stories of the evening news. Tribal identity is not working. So let me say it again. It's not just a philosophical problem out there in the culture and on the news. It is deeply personal in our own lives. At various times in your life, you have struggled with your identity as a husband, as a provider, as a mother, 
as a wife, your value, your worth, your purpose. Children are always in the process of forming an identity. Teenagers are experimenting with identity and adults are questioning the identity they've chosen or feel has been thrust upon them. That's the problem we face as human beings, as people who live together in this community. We have an identity problem, but there is hope for finding our true identity and for rooting our value and the value of all other people in our community and around the world rooting their value and their worth in creation in its proper place. There is, no, there is hope in ending the inevitable divisions that arise if we segregate ourselves by race or gender or sexual ethic or class or politics. As we look into the scripture, God speaks to our identity. It's almost the very first thing he says in Genesis. And then from Genesis onward in the Bible, he repeatedly and lovingly tells us again and again and again through his whole word to us who we really are and how to live as who we are. So let's look at God's word and see how he deals with our identity and how he deals with these two issues of separation and distancing ourselves on, from others on one hand and tribalism and trying to join ourselves by merit to a tribe on the other hand. Let's pray. Father God, as we look into your word, I just pray that by your Holy Spirit, eyes would be opened, hearts would be softened, minds would be keenly attuned to the wisdom that you share with us to tell us who you truly are as our Father and who you intend us to be as your children. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So first of all, we need to, instead of finding our identity in sameness, in differences, we need to find our identity in sameness. And this is what God lays out to us from the very beginning. When we look into scripture at the very beginning in Genesis, God says that all humanity, all men and women around the world are made in the image of God, that that is the root of our identity that we are all created in the image of God and have value and worth apart from any superficial or any horizontal differences. Our value is not found in our relationship to each other, but in our likeness to and our relationship vertically with the Creator. There's a word that's used in Christian uh, circles for this. It's called the imago Deo, or the image of God. It is a reality for every human being on earth, and it imbues us with unique dignity and glory in creation. But the imago Deo is something that's been distorted by sin. The fact that we are made in the image of God has been dimmed by these false horizontal identities. It's been glossed over even in the church at times. Our culture has gotten to the point where the fact that we are made in the image of God means nothing to people. Even in irreligious societies of the past where church wasn't all that important, the understanding and the knowledge in Western culture especially that all humanity was made in the image of God permeated our laws, it permeated our politics, it permeated our human interactions. But in the last couple centuries, it's virtually evaporated to the point where the image of God in each other has been overridden by these horizontal identities. It has been overridden and dimmed and tarnished by horizontal seeking after identity instead of vertical. And that has led to a lot of the problems that we talked about in the introduction. So we have to ask ourselves, even in the church, when we've glossed over our feeling this, the reality of the image of God in others, how do we remember and recover the identity that we receive from God and not the identity that we receive from others? In Genesis 1.26, says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then in Genesis 5, 1 to 3, it says, when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them man or Adam, mankind, when they were created. That's the, the Hebrew word Adam is the word for mankind. And then it became capital A, Adam, a name that represented or was the name of Adam, uh, the first man created. And it says, when Adam, the name Adam, had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And so we see here at the very beginning, Christians listen to this. God made man in his image and our children, as we recreate children in our image, 
are also in the image of God. And so this likeness or this image bearing of God is something that we inherit vertically from our Creator. And we cannot forget this as Christians when we interact with each other and when we consider our own identity. There's a value inherent in our image bearing that gives each person also a right to justice. Genesis 9, 6 says, whoever sheds blood will have their blood shed because God made man in his image. And we're not going to go down, you know, all the stuff that the Old and the New Testament talks about social justice. But just the idea here that it is because we are made in the image of God that people are deserving of justice. And we can talk about that in terms of economic justice, in terms of legal justice, in terms of social justice, all kinds of, of justice that the Bible gets into. Human worth is also connected, not just to being made in the likeness of God, but connected to the love and care and compassion of God for us. Psalm 8.3 says, What is a human that you care for him? You made him a little less than God, in the likeness of God, just a, a little less than God. Isaiah 43, 1 says, But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, rooted in creation, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, speaking of the nation, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. And so the identity of God's people, the identity of the nations, is that he has called them and he makes them his. So there's two root ideas here in the Bible that is established, that we are valued and worthy of justice because we're made in the image of God, that's the vertical, but not only that, that we are made in the image, that we are made in the image of God, but also that God also loves and cares for us, desiring to rescue us and give us standing as his own people. This is what is established at the very beginning of the Bible. And in this sense, we begin to see right away that our identity is now rooted not primarily in ourselves or in the horizontal. It's not primarily rooted in our interaction with other people or even in our genetics or our standing or our wealth or the color of our skin or our gender or anything else. Our identity is rooted in our relationship to God and the image bearing of God that we are meant to do. It's not value or identity that flows from who or how or when and in what condition we happen to be born or what attributes we have, but rather our identity is rooted equally for everyone on the planet in who our creator is and in his love towards his creation. And we could follow that theme through all of the Old Testament, but let's move forward into the New Testament and see that God's love for us as a source for our identity is not by separation, but in unity through specifically his act of love to us in Jesus Christ. And this theme is so prevalent in the Bible, it's almost impossible just to pick one or two texts in the New Testament. The Gospels in the New Testament make direct statements about our identity in Christ over 70 times, and the theme of our identity in Christ and our unity in Christ is discussed well over 100 times just in the four Gospels and the 23 letters that we have in the New Testament. But just picking out a couple of these, again, as I say, over 100 examples, let's just look at a couple. The Apostle Paul, who is writing on the implications of Jesus' teaching and inspired by the Holy Spirit, applies what Jesus did to the diverse, multi-ethnic, multi-class, multi-faceted people of the Roman Empire. You can imagine Rome or Ephesus or Colossae or any of these Roman cities and towns that are teeming with a variety of people, worshiping a variety of God of all different skin color and all different languages. And Paul says to this teeming mass of different people, he says in Ephesians 2, 13 and 14, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off has been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. You see, this is the difference. We're made in God's image. It is about our sameness. It is about our common heritage as children of God and created in his image. image. And then more fully, Paul explains, it is our unity in Jesus. That in Jesus specifically, the walls of hostility or the walls of division have been broken down. Because of God's love expressed through the person and work of Jesus, we don't divide anymore over differences. 
We don't give ourselves an identity based on the difference that we are from other people. There are no more walls of hostility between people based on their flesh, their economics, their heritage, their status. Man, could we use that today? Could we use that message in the world and in our own lives that we are not to differentiate based on the horizontal, that we are not that different? Our forms of identity on the horizontal build walls and they increase hostility, whereas Jesus tears walls down and decreases hostility. And there's a message there for all Christians. Brother or sister, if you find your biblical convictions are increasing your hostility and causing you to emphasize how different people are from you, then you are misunderstanding what Jesus has said and done and how he calls us to live in the world. Christians are not hostility encouragers in language or in action. We are hostility reducers. We are wall taker downers, not wall builders. Paul goes on that there is no inequality of race, gender, or class. He says in his letter to the Galatians in 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This message of unity and sameness and identity in Christ goes on and on. Now this verse obviously does not deny that there are ethnic and political divisions and that they all cease to exist. Paul is speaking in Galatia. He's speaking in the Roman Empire. He knows that there are many different ethnic people and that there are many tribes and many tongues and there are many differences. But what he is saying is not that all of those things disappear. He's saying that our, our identity in those things and the divisions that those tribes create the animosity or the separation that occurs because of those identities is no longer valid in Jesus Christ. They are superseded, they are transcended by a transcendent identity in Christ. No longer is our identity in the horizontal relationship and what we were born into, or what we achieved, or what we merit. It is in Jesus alone. The image of God and our image bearing in Christ says that people are not as different from you as you think. We're all made in the image of God. Our identity is not bound up in who we are. Our identity is in our image bearing of God and who we are in Christ. This oneness and the freedom that comes with our true identity where we are same rather than distant. When it's undistorted by sin and we no longer chase after false identities, then we truly are united as one. And then we are truly set free from striving to qualify ourselves to belong to something else. We're free from measuring up. We're free from the demands of earning our merit badge in order to belong, which is the second thing that we try to do horizontally without Jesus or without God. So firstly, we are all the same primarily because of the Imago Dei, that we are made in the image of God and that we are one in Christ, and he breaks down the walls of hostility. He breaks down the walls of our differences. But secondly, we no longer have to try by our merit to belong to another tribe. Identity in Christ is on his qualifications, not ours. We are set free from striving. We're set free from the slavery of conforming to identities that are rooted in ourselves instead of having our identity imputed to us from our creator, not by any virtue or not by any work or not by any merit of our own. Whenever you need, whenever you need to prove some character or virtue of yourself in order to belong to any group, make no mistake, you are, forming, you are, you are performing and you are participating in a form of religion. In every social identity group that you could identify with, there emerges a high priesthood that establishes what the virtues are that admit entrance, and they police those virtues. And if you violate those virtues, you are expelled. If you signal those virtues well, then you are accepted. Whether it is, as we're looking at now to our friends to the South, the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, whether it's signaling your conservative values or your liberal values, whether it's a group dedicated to ethnic identity or gender identity or class identity or professional identity or lifestyle identity, you name it. It can be as fundamental as the color of your skin or as superficial as the truck you drive. But the stronger the sense of identity is in that group and the greater hope and value that people place in that identity, then the more strident and rigid the rules of acceptance become and the more swift the expulsion of impurity manifests itself. 
If you step an inch outside of the lines of some of these identity groups where people have put their whole life and their whole hope in belonging to, then you will be swiftly expelled. And that is, make no mistake, a form of religion. It may be a secular religion, but that kind of identity making is all about a high priesthood that polices the virtues and expels the impure. But then God comes along in the Old Testament and in the New, and he says, all tribes and tongues can be called my people. There are no barriers. Jesus says, you don't have to earn your right to belong. You receive it freely on what I've done. You don't have to be strong enough or smart enough or Jewish enough or Greek enough or good enough or even religious enough. God says, Jesus is our righteousness. He is our virtue on our behalf. He is our merit. He is our qualification. Jesus is our all and is in all. Let's see where it says that in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. He says, for by grace, not merit, grace, you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship. See, it's again, it's again rooted in creation. His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, it is by grace. It is not by our works or by our merit. It is because we are the workmanship of God that we have identity in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.3, Paul says, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, you're now being perfected by the flesh? Why are you trying to earn and merit your identity by the flesh? That is not how God sees you. And then later in that same letter to the Galatians in chapter 4, Paul says that God sent his son, Jesus, born under the conditions of the law, or born under the conditions of merit, born under the conditions of trying to measure up in order to set free those of us that were enslaved to the law or enslaved to performance, enslaved to qualifying in order to have our identity and to have our place and purpose so that we could be adopted into the family of God to receive our true identity, not by our work, but by what Jesus has done. Colossians 3, 2 to 3, like I said, there's over a hundred of these places we could talk about this. They all say the same thing. Colossians 3, 2 to 3 says, set your minds on things that are above, vertical, not horizontal. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died to those things that are horizontal, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are safe. Your life, your identity is hidden. It is safe. It is preserved with Jesus. Jesus sets us free from that soul-crushing striving to merit our belonging in some social club and putting our hope in false identities that we are going to be man enough or tough enough or provider enough or wife enough or mother enough. That we are going to be anything enough. Jesus takes all of those demands away. All of those false identities that only demand more of us in order to belong that encrust us over with their sameness, that force us into categories and places that ultimately weary us and are soul-destroying. Jesus comes along and says, let's scrape off these false identities. Let's remove what sin and false hopes have dimmed. Let's take away these false demands so I can show you that you are worthy and your worth and your identity is not in what you were born into, what genetics you have, what abilities you have, how anything you are. You're worthy because I created you and I love you because my compassion is upon you. Let me rescue you from the attic or behind the door or wherever it is that you have been sort of hidden away and let me stand you in the light of my love and affection. This is what it means. Every person is valued and finds their worth not in their class or virtue or race or gender or any other manufactured identity, but because they are made in the image of God and that by faith have equal right to being called children of God. So how does this give you hope then as you look for your identity? And it could be an identity crisis of just the last few months. It could be the identity crisis of your whole life. I don't know. Maybe since you were a teenager in high school, you've struggled with who you are or you've struggled with where to fit in. Maybe it's just been, you know, turning 40 and wondering, you know, what is my life and where do I fit and who am I and what is my value? 
Maybe you've lost some ability or you've lost some place in society and you are struggling to know who you are and what you're worth. How do you appropriate? How, appropriate, how do you recover? How do you receive this identity as an image bearer of God and as a child of God? Well, John 1, 12 to 13 says this, but to all who did receive him, that's Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not about your genetics, nor of the will of the flesh, it's not about how hard you work, nor of the will of man, it's not the identity other people give you, but of God. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God, not because of anything horizontal, but because of the creator God. God does allow us to choose. And as we see in the world today, many, too many, put their hope not in the creator, but in the created and in themselves. And those who choose that way do not have their identity in Christ. They are not united in his life and death and resurrection. They do not enjoy the oneness with God and hope in a future united with Christ. God says this is available to everyone equally to know this hope, to receive this new identity. If you trust in what Jesus has done, he, if we will let go of our false identities, of our clinging to what is horizontal, if we will confess our rejection and our rebellion against our creator and our stubborn refusal to find our identity in him and our rejection of his love, if we turn away from the world and towards God, he will receive you. It says he gives you the right to become children of God just as he intended. He gives you the right to claim your true identity. You no longer need to find your belonging in any tribe of this world because all tribes are one in Christ. He breaks down those walls of hostility. With faith in Christ, you are secure. You do not need to put up walls of defense and separate yourself from others or wrestle with others for your identity or fear that it will be consumed or overpowered by others because you are secure in your identity in Jesus. You're set free from all these ultimately fleshly and self-glorifying differences that we use to separate ourselves from others and to define our identity in isolation and separation. Those are all rightly brought to nothing so that we are set free from that constant struggle and instead we rest our identity in Jesus where we're accepted on the basis of his, of his merit and not our merit. When we look at the news today, when we consider even our own lives, God and Jesus are calling us to rest and to cease striving. This is the hope that we have in the Bible. Ultimately, not so much in the Bible, not so much in the scriptures, although it is the word of God. It is the hope that we have in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who is the manifestation. He's the appearance of the love of God. All of the love of God is made perfect in Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus, the scriptures tell us again and again and again, has come to set us free, to break down the walls of hostility, and to free us from striving to qualify he is our qualification. You can find your identity in him. And this is a message for believers and unbelievers. The image of God that we are made in, even as believers, is often forgotten and tarnished and glossed over. And we need to recover it. And for those who are trying to find their identity newly in Christ, know that God loves you. That as you turn to him, as you believe and trust in the work and the merit of Christ, he will receive you and you are a new creation in him. Your identity is secure, not to be threatened by any other identity on this world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And this was kind of a, a high level kind of philosophical overview of the message of the Christian faith, of what you have told us it means deep-rooted, inherently in our being, what it means that we are created by a God that loves us, that we have an identity that is apart from anything anyone around us tries to put on us or what we grasp from the world around us. Our true identity is not in the color of our skin. It's not in the language we speak. It's not in the tribe we're born into, nor the tribe that we attach ourselves to. Our true identity is meant to be found in you and for all those Christian or otherwise, who are struggling in finding hope in who they are. Father, help us to recover our true identity. 
Help us by your Holy Spirit to turn towards you, to turn towards your Son, Jesus, and to put our hope in who we are in him. I pray that anyone who does not understand this or who needs this hope would reach out to someone that they know, someone they know who has this hope within them, and that they can begin this journey back towards their true identity in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.